to Revival Radio TV. Today is the final part of our four-part series on the Reformation. Jesus has assembled many great men who were the luminaries of the Reformation, and they were the great lights that inspired the motto, Post Tenebris Lux, from Job 17, 12. And in the Latin, it means simply, after darkness, light. And perhaps the greatest of these in the 17th century you have men that were called the Puritans. They were actually given that name by their enemies. They simply called themselves the hot Protestants, people whose faith was so hot that it burned. Believers who considered themselves reformed and were on a mission to reform whatever needed reforming. The Puritans are enjoying a renaissance as role models. And in many circles, they're still shaping how we think about God. Many words are used to describe the Puritans and godly, educated, but above all, they were concerned for the church of Jesus Christ as his body and his bride. Today, many secular historians want to insult them and denigrate their faith, and they get their facts from the book, The Scarlet Letter. This book's fiction written centuries after the fact by someone with an agenda. But if you want to understand anything about the Puritans, you must understand the movement began as an attempt to reform the Church of England. They wanted to continue to reform everything that needed reforming. And they sought to put Jesus Christ in his rightful place as King and Lord of the Church. Men who were called the Puritans really knew Jesus as their Lord. They were great theologians and they were prolific writers. In fact, here's just some of the titles that were written over 400 years ago, but are still popular today. For instance, John Bunyan, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Here's a popular book that's still winning souls by Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Or what about this one, Jonathan Edwards, Freedom of the Will. And Philip Doddridge's book, The Rise and Progress of Religion in Their Soul. Man, these were great, and there's so many more Listen, the biggest one is this one, Pilgrim's Progress, the number two bestseller in the world of all time, second only to the Bible itself. The Puritans were great preachers and they wrote prolifically, but preaching was their passion. They would get together what they called prophesying in groups of 10 or 12 men, and they would preach to each other about Scripture. And the lay people would then come and they would listen and they were great preachers. People loved to hear them preach often for hours. They said this, if you could not preach it, then it was not good theology. God was really pouring out his revelation on this generation. They took over Oxford and Cambridge and they were turning out preachers and theologians that would go on to change history. Their understanding of the Lordship of Christ in every part of everyday life had immense consequences. The Puritan work ethic often spoke of the virtue of industry, as they called it. It was the opposite of sloth or laziness and very much connected to reformed ideas. Puritans believed and influenced believers to make Jesus the Lord of whatever they did in their vocation and to engage in work in the secular world and to accumulate wealth to be used for the glory of God. This was new and this new work ethic gave a rise to modern capitalism and helped change the world as we know it. In fact, to understand the way the Puritans think, I like the way the Puritan songwriter of the hymn Amazing Grace, John Newton put it. He said, I know two things. I was a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. I've asked myself, why were these men such vibrant Christians and powerful theologians? I think the answer is because they lived every day in the heat of the battle. What we think of as history, they were living in, and they needed answers and searched the scriptures until they found it. These are the things that we can't imagine, like martyrdom, war, plague, and exile. It made them ask questions like, what was rightful place for the kings? What was government? What about a state church? These men didn't have all the answers, but they knew one thing. The source of their answers was the Word of God. Sola Scriptura, as the reformers loved to say.
So here we are, about 100 years after John Wycliffe, and the country that started the Reformation can no longer contain it. The English Reformation that created the Puritans who wanted to purify every part of life were beginning to question if this was even possible. They were no longer satisfied by Queen Elizabeth's middle way where she led the Anglican church between Catholicism and Protestantism. And then when she died, the heir to the throne was Henry VIII's nephew, King James of Scotland. Scotland had already established a Presbyterian church, so the Puritans were hopeful and excited. There's a road going down the middle of England since before the Romans, and it was on this great north road that the King James was coming down to take his throne as the King of England when the Puritans came out to meet him. And they came to give him their petition of a thousand things that they wanted to change about the Church of England. James was suspicious of the Puritans that they wanted Presbyterian rule of the church, which he said. Presbyterians agreeeth with the monarch like the devil agreeeth with God. No, I won't have it. The only thing on the list he did like was the idea of a single English Bible. And out of that came this, the King James Bible. The king's attitude pushed the Puritans past the point of no return. One group saw no way out but to separate themselves from the Church of England. They were called separatists, and today we know them and love them simply as the pilgrims. William Bradford was one of these separatists. He had been an orphan farm boy from a little village in the English countryside, and because he was alone a lot, he took solace in reading his Bible. And through his Bible, God got a hold of him. Imagine a 12-year-old boy walking 10 miles down a dirt road to the village of Scrooby to attend secret meetings and hear forward-thinking Puritan preachers like John Robinson and Richard Clifton. And they preached revolutionary things like, wherever two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst of you. Now this was radical because they didn't need a bishop or a priest. All they needed was each other, and they were the body, and Christ was the head. This was the main separatist text, and one that eventually led them to separate from the Church of England. This young man, William Bradford, grew up among this hot Protestant congregation and would follow them on to Holland, and then to America on the Mayflower. He eventually became their leader when John Carver died. They stayed 10 years in Holland and it gave them time to grow and develop in the word as a church, which is something they could never do in England. But Holland wasn't their home. They wanted something more where they could put down roots and follow what their Bible said. This is when the idea of going to a new world came up. Surprisingly, it was easy to get a charter from the king who thought the new colonies would strengthen English claims on the land and to get the Puritan troublemakers out of England. One of the reasons we know so much about the pilgrims is William Bradford's writings. Here I have history of the Plymouth Plantation. He often put his feelings down in prose. He wasn't just writing about history because it gives a window into their hearts. But then a place did God provide. In wilderness he did guide unto the American shore where they made way many more. So, with a charter from the king and a tired small ship named the Mayflower, the day came for them to leave. On the windswept dock in Plymouth, England, as they were about to board the Mayflower, their pastor, John Robinson, began his prayer for their journey by reading Proverbs 4.18, the word is light. John Robinson prophesied to the pilgrims to expect more light to be revealed when they reached the promised land. This was just the first step and more would be revealed. They were expecting guidance and revelations from the Holy Spirit. Now their story of the crossing is an inspirational story full of danger and struggle. But what we see once again is God's providence. Instead of them going to the original location which was part of the Virginia colony where they would have been influenced by the culture of that colony, which is what they were trying to be separate from, they were blown off course to an abandoned village. It was a better place to settle with good water and land. 
and the neighboring Wampanoag Native Americans were friendly. But wait, it gets better. The only Indian in America that spoke English was Squanto, who adopted them and not only translated for them, but showed them how to fish and to plant and how to hunt. And this helped them survive those first few years. Now, because they were not where the charter said they would go, they felt they needed a document that explained the government and what they were going to agree to. This conscientious effort to establish a government became more prophetic because they were breaking new ground. The men that would become the great philosophers of the Enlightenment and write so eloquently about God and government were young men, yet they were deep thinkers. What God did with the pilgrims, he was leading them politically and socially where nobody in history had ever gone before. And that's why I think Bradford had a sense of destiny, that Plymouth was about more than the few pilgrims on tiny farms. It was God's hand of destiny at play. He wrote for the next generation. He, he recorded what they were doing, but it was written for the next generation. And it's interesting that that really became a huge part of the culture of New England. And New England culture was so different from, for example, Virginia culture. And that's where the first colony came in 1607, 13 years before the Pilgrims. But they came as a very unreformed culture. The, the Pilgrims came from the Reformation, which means they are centered, they are focused on the Bible. The Jamestown colony came as all Anglicans. They're part of the state-established church, and it was a state-established church that was persecuting Christians and, and doing so much wrong. So you, you have, a, in, in Plymouth, you have a very Bible-centered, very individualistic mentality. In Jamestown, you have a very established church, high church-centered group mentality. They didn't think the same at all. The one thing that the pilgrims, or the first comers, as they called themselves, did accomplish was that they were the beachhead. They proved that you could follow God into the wilderness and worship Him without worrying about being imprisoned or burned at the stake. They moved the Reformation from Europe to America and brought that Puritan mindset with them. Before we wrap up this segment on the pilgrims, let me read you something that William Bradford wrote. He had a, a revelation of the part that the pilgrims played in establishing this next generation though they didn't achieve the brotherhood of believers they were hoping for. He thought, maybe the next generation will. Thus, out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced by his hand that made all things of nothing and gives being to all things that are. And as one small candle that may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shone unto many, yea, to our whole nation, that the glorious name of Jehovah have all the praise. Ten years after the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, King James' son Charles I was on the throne. Those Puritans who had not separated from the Church of England but worked for reform saw increasing difficulty and they sensed the odds of success were against them. They faced the hard alternative of conforming at great cost to their conscience or defying at great cost to their lives and their fortune. But there was still one more option. They could migrate to the new world. Some Puritans had applied for a charter under the name of the Massachusetts Bay Company. And with a document in hand, the time seemed ripe for a migration. John Winthrop, lawyer, Puritan, and soon to be first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, noted that God hath disposed of the hearts and so many of his wise and faithful servants, both ministers and others, not only to approve the enterprise, but to interest themselves in it. About 700 sailed with Winthrop in March 1630 on the Arabella. Another 300 followed soon after and another thousand before the year was out. The decade of the 1630s, producing what has been called the Great Migration, saw the population of Massachusetts Bay soar to nearly 9,000. Thus, the colony did not lack labor, skills, productive farmers, and infusions of new blood. These new Puritans made a point 
to not be called separatists. Although what the king considered his worst became America's best. While on the Arabella, John Withrop preached his famous sermon entitled, A Model of Christian Charity. Just as one would avoid shipwreck at sea, said Winthrop, so they must avoid similar hazards on land. The only way to do that was to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. If they would so conduct themselves, the Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us. They were entered into the covenant with God for this work. Winthrop saw the Puritan venture as a way of demonstrating how nations could prosper and be blessed. God, Winthrop said, would make us a praise and glory, so much so that men will say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England. In short, the famous phrase, we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill the eyes of all people are upon us. What set Massachusetts apart from the Virginia colonies was its adherence to certain ideas that have been termed the New England mindset or Puritanism. By the second year, John Winthrop expressed his gratitude to God for leading him across the sea where he and his family were safe and not scrambling away from the wrath of the king and his ungodly state church. He wrote this, God had brought an endless parade of fat hogs, venison, poultry, and geese to our homes. And he continued, this outpouring of joy and manifestation of God's love was a great marvel. The question was, no longer would they survive, but what would they build in what they considered this land of promise? The early settlers of Massachusetts included more than 100 graduates of Oxford and Cambridge. One historian termed Massachusetts the best educated community the world has ever known. They were indeed educators. They took literacy with them and started schools and colleges, and unemployment was virtually non-existent in New England. A visitor from abroad testified, in seven years, I never saw a beggar. When the Puritan preacher John Cotton arrived, he admonished the believers for forgetting their first love. And here's what happened. Revival broke out. In Boston alone, the first church doubled in size under Cotton. Winthrop himself wrote that he had been drowsy and he suddenly realized that Cotton's voice of peace brought him back to the true knowledge of God. This might have been the very first revival in America. The new world gave them room away from the king and away from a state church to evolve into the next level and to exercise the principles of Jesus is Lord in every area of everyday life. They had to learn by trial and error what their counterparts that stayed in England would learn only by a bloody civil war. Our Puritans learned you can't legislate morality. Puritans didn't die out, evolved into what we recognize today as our American heritage. The American colonies became, in one historian's words, the most Protestant, Reformed, and Puritan commonwealths in the world. When American colonists declared their independence in 1776, a full 75% came from Puritan roots. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we'd call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. The Puritans that stayed behind in England were unable to live under the crushing weight of the increased oppression of the king and the state church. When Charles I was crowned king, he asserted his authority over parliament, the church, and the people with even more vigor than his father, James I. Charles was a man who had been raised believing in the divine right 
of kings to rule as supreme authority over their subjects. But Charles was the wrong man at the wrong time. The Reformation had given birth to new ideas and the Puritans believed only in the divine authority of God and His Word. The Puritans wouldn't violate their biblical principles and what they saw as their mission to reform themselves and the church. And when the king issued arrest warrants for Cromwell and other leaders of the parliament, the parliament voted to raise a people's army to oppose the king. The English Civil War had begun and sadly, all the Puritans who had stayed behind in England were caught up in it. Oliver Cromwell was born in 1599 and was born again in his 30s. He was the epitome of the middle-class Puritan Christians that had taken leadership in almost every area of English life. Cromwell proved to have an uncanny ability to lead men, and he chose men for his new model army that was organized on the radical idea that officers should be chosen on merit and not just by birth. Cromwell called them poor, prayerful men. Among the ranks were many men who would become Puritan leaders like, well, John Bunyan. And after one battle, Cromwell said, God would, by things which are not, bring to nothing things that are. The English Civil War was England's most bloody war to date. Finally, Cromwell defeated Charles' army, arrested him, and took him back to Parliament to negotiate terms. In an unprecedented trial, Charles was found guilty of treason against the English people and was sentenced to death. He was the first European monarch to lose his head at the hands of the people. The new parliament couldn't come up with a constitution or establishing a functioning republic. They did some things right. They passed laws of religious freedom. They emancipated the Jews and allowed them into England as free men. But they did a lot of things wrong too. They tried to govern from the top down over an ungodly people. The new parliament tried to legislate morality. They closed down brothels and pubs. They even banned Christmas. For the common man who was used to church holidays and drunken celebrations, these policies chafed them and gave rise to a new pejorative term, puritanical. Cromwell died of natural causes and without a clear national direction, the people conspired to bring back Charles' son, Charles II. This was like a mass delusion, forgetting all the oppression they had just thrown off. It was like the Civil War never happened. Charles II was crowned king. Of course, he was out to kill anyone who was involved in his father's death. The Puritans were fully blamed for executing his father in a whole new wave of religious persecution began. This was the time period where men like John Bunyan were thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. All the Puritan preachers were fired and couldn't preach within five miles of their church. Lay preachers couldn't preach without a license. You couldn't hold a meeting with more than five people attending outside of the church. The king repealed all the moral laws and allowed the pubs and brothels to reopen. It seemed as though all the improvements were lost because of the backlash against the Puritans. Now stay with me because things are about to change. In 1685, Charles II died unexpectedly. His Catholic brother, James II, now became king. James believed he had more power than he really had. In three short years, it would all come crashing down around them as this unstoppable momentum of the Reformation would drive history away from their kings and their unlimited authority over men. To make an already long story short, Parliament secretly invited James, Protestant daughter, who was married to the Protestant Dutch King, William of Orange, to come take the throne of England. Only they had to agree to share power with Parliament permanently. So modern day England was born. Now finally, England had a constitutional monarchy where there was freedom of religion and limited power of the monarch. This was later known as the Glorious Revolution because it was almost a bloodless change of power. The Glorious Revolution of 1688 is the event that forever changed the English government, moving the balance of power from the throne to parliament. This brings us to perhaps the most important Puritan, let me tell you this one last story 
of an English Puritan who wrote a book that changed the world, John Locke. He is widely regarded as one of the most influential thinkers of the Enlightenment, and he was a product of his age. He was a writer, a theologian, a philosopher, and even a medical doctor. Both his parents were Puritans, and Locke was obviously raised that way too, but he was also a passionate Christian. He wrote a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on Paul's epistles. He wrote a topical Bible that he called a commonplace book of the Holy Bible, and it listed verses by subject. And then he wrote reasonableness of Christianity as stated in the scriptures. But then this book, Two Treatise of Government, is the one that changed England and America. In it, he quoted the Bible 1,500 times. It is the primary book that influenced this document here, the American Declaration of Independence. Now, there are many phrases in the Declaration of Independence that are almost word-by-word -word quotes, like life, liberty, and property. That phrase, Thomas Jefferson changed to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Locke's landmark book put forth his revolutionary ideas concerning the natural rights of man and the social contract. And this was the colonel for the English Bill of Rights, which became the model for the American Bill of Rights. John Locke's ideas gave the American Puritans and their descendants the tools that Cromwell didn't have. And that's why now, over 100 years later, they could lay the foundations of a godly government and America would fulfill John Winthrop's vision of a city shining on a hill. For we are as a city sitting upon a hill, a shining light, a beacon light to the rest of the earth to what Jesus can and will do in a nation that honors him and lays itself at his feet. Praise God.